Okay, we're back. We're live. We're doing Corona Watch as we do at noon on Wednesday. And uh, we have a really, really, really special guest today. Dwayne Gubler. He joins us uh, remote uh, from Utah, where he has retired the third time. But um, Dwayne went to uh, Johns Hopkins uh, and studied uh, geo, all kinds of science. And his degree is not an ordinary PhD. It's a it's a PhD in science, and it's more demanding than an ordinary PhD. And from there, he spent time gee, all over the world uh, with uh, uh, with the, the, uh, um, the CDC and uh, uh, the National Institutes of Health and uh, the World Health Organization. He's been through it, and he's and he's he was in his faculty with the John A. Burns School of Medicine, and then he left. Uh, gee, must be uh, 10, 15 years ago. Uh, to go to Singapore, courtesy Duke University and the National University of Singapore, um, where he had a laboratory, a laboratory he always wanted for infectious diseases. That's his specialty. Uh, he has since retired, but he's left his, his mark on uh, Singapore. In fact, they, uh, they wanted him to be, they, he made him a, an honorary Singapore uh, citizen, which is really something. Uh, so um, gee, you've really been around, Wayne, and I must say that uh, since I have known you, I have I have found and treated you as a guy who is 10 feet tall. Our viewers cannot tell from, from the, the photograph, from the, the video, but you are 10 feet tall. Uh, you are a world name in infectious diseases. And it's an honor, beyond an honor, to have you on our show today. Thanks for coming around. We really appreciate it. Well, thank you, Jay, for inviting me. And um, I only wished I was as tall as you. Uh, I uh, think I am in terms of <laughs> Well, we can disagree on that. <laughs> anyway, today, uh, you know, the question before the House is why is COVID-19 so contagious and what we can do, what, what can we do about it? How much do we really know about it? You have studied all kinds of infectious diseases. And, you know, what is, what is special? Well, I think there is something special uh, about the uh, coronavirus. Uh, you've seen it, you've studied it. What do you think about it? Is it more of a threat than others? Well, that's hard to say because we don't know what the others are. Uh, if you um, uh, look at what's happened in the past uh, 30 or 40 years, we've had a series of uh, major epidemics and pandemics that have swept the world. And uh, it's hard to know what the next one is going to be. Uh, uh, we have a problem, Jay, of, um, of uh, what I call circular migration. Uh, people uh, moving from rural areas into cities and then back to the rural areas to visit family and harvest crops. Uh, they're constantly introducing new pathogens that have been infecting people for thousands of years in areas, introducing them into crowded urban centers that have 10 to 20 million people. And every one of those urban centers has a uh, modern airport uh, through which millions of the pass every year and it provides the ideal mechanism to move pathogens around. Now, most of these pathogens, which are usually the animal parasites uh, of one kind, uh, don't uh, really uh, take in humans. There's not secondary transmission. But once in a while, uh, we see one like uh, the corona, uh, SARS corona 2 virus that uh, is highly infectious to humans. Uh, has secondary transmission and moves very rapidly around the world. SARS was another one of those uh, in recent years, in 2003. Um, others like Nipah encephalitis uh, weren't as infectious and didn't spread. Um, but uh, there are many other viruses. Uh, we estimate over 500 viruses in animals out there that have the potential to uh, to move into humans. Uh, of those 500, we know that 100 of them will actually infect humans. And uh, so I don't know whether this one is really special in the sense of uh, its pathogenicity and uh, infectivity or not. I think there are probably others out there that are just as bad. Mm. You know, one, one, one thing I just noticed yesterday was that in Japan, which has its own problem about coronavirus, which is a pretty serious emergency right now, uh, there, there are people um, investigating the notion of micro, micro uh, droplets, micro droplets, not a sneeze or a cough, but breathing and talking. 
uh, and they use slow motion photography, some kind of infrared photography, and to see the droplets, which are very, very small. I, I, I don't know what very small is in that context, but it's like 0 0.01 you know, micrometer or something. And, and you can see them in the room and they stay in the room. And the people who spray them, you know, leave the room, someone else has comes in the room and this kind of explains, and it doesn't take a whole lot of virus. What do you call them, vir virion? It doesn't take a lot of virus particles to infect you. And so if you walk into that room, you're in trouble. This sounds like it's way more contagious than we originally thought when everybody talked about sneezing and coughing and touching surfaces, uh, it's in the room. And there's not too much you can do about that, except I suppose open the window, go outdoors or treat the room. Well, I think this makes it very contagious. And that's why we're having all these issues about, uh, what do you think about that? Is this, is this new? No, it's not new, but it's uh, certainly true. And uh, we're learning more and more about aerosolization and how how uh, pathogens that are transmitted by the respiratory route uh, move. Uh, you know, if we if we look at the pandemics uh, that have occurred, they're generally of two types of transmission. One is the respiratory route, and that's, of course, uh, the most important. The other is by mosquitoes, and that's where my specialty lies, is in mosquito-transmitted diseases. But uh, the respiratory route uh, is the most important. And when you cough or you sneeze, you uh, expel uh, respiratory droplets. Uh, the bigger ones fall out very rapidly, but uh, there are little bubbles that go out and uh, those pop and uh, that aerosolizes the uh, virus. And um, a, uh, if you uh, talk loud, or if you're singing, or if you cough, or you sneeze, you can push those uh, particles, those aerosolized particles, out, um, you know, several meters in, in front of you. And if it's a closed environment, and no air movement, no good ventilation, then uh, other people that are in the room can be infected. There was an incident in, in Washington uh, State uh, recently where the uh, 75, uh, I think, I forget, 60 people, I think it was, uh, attended the choir practice. And uh, two or three days later, uh, they had uh, people coming down with, uh, which was turned out to be COVID-19 um, disease. And 75% of that choir became with uh, 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 SARS two virus and and then clearly it was all due to aerosolization and respiratory droplets in a confined space. One of the most dangerous places you can go uh, when there's something like uh, 19 spreading is a um, elevator. You get in there, there's absolutely no movement of air. And if someone sneezes or coughs, you can rest assured you're gonna breathe it in. Well, what can you do about it? Uh, you know, there's all this talk about masks, and we had, a, we had, I think, a false start in terms of public information. You know, we talked before the show about the the intersection of politics and and um, politics and science, and I think we got some bad information about masks and uh, the use of masks. And you know, people were led to believe. Most people still do believe that the only person who should wear the mask is the person who has the disease. But in fact, if, if we have a spray going on in the elevator or in a room with no ventilation, I think I'd want a mask. I would want a very, really strong mask. Uh, so I didn't breathe that in. Does a mask help? What do you think about this? Well, there's, uh, as you say, it's uh, controversial. Um, a mask will not protect you against uh, most masks. Uh, the surgical masks that most people use will not protect you against the aerosolized virus. Uh, they will protect you against the larger respiratory droplets, but those are relatively unimportant uh, by comparison. And so uh, one of the reasons why uh, masks were not recommended and, and are, they are recommended now, but have not been recommended, is that uh, the argument is, is that if uh, people are putting masks on, it gives them a false sense of security and they think they're protected and they'll do do things that they're not supposed to, i.e. not uh, be uh, conscientious about social dist uh, 
distancing and so forth. So without any doubt, masks can reduce uh, some transmission um, to really prevent uh, infection. And it doesn't uh, prevent 100% uh, protection against aerosolized virus. You need what they call N95 masks, uh, which will filter out most of it if it's fitted properly. But most of the masks that you see don't fit properly. Uh, they don't filter out the aerosolized virus. And so uh, it probably uh, is maybe, probably doesn't help a whole lot because people take chances they otherwise wouldn't normally do. The other thing a mask does is when you touch your face all the time, it uh, prevents you from touching your mouth and your nose, uh, not so much mm -hmm. your eyes. But uh, So it's controversial, but uh, yeah. it used properly, me, they can decrease the transmission. Let me, let me go to that. Um, so you have entryways, entryways that ultimately go into the respiratory system. And we've been told that, uh, you know, it's the nose, obviously, you're breathing air into your respiratory system. It's the mouth, I suppose, because uh, from your mouth, it goes down and, and forks into your lungs, uh, you know, as opposed to your uh, esophagus. Um, and, and uh, I mean, people have said, well, it's the eyes, and they wear these plastic masks in order to prevent the spray into the eyes. And, and I've even heard the ears, uh, because the ears can also drain into the, respiratory, into the sinus, into the respiratory system. But, you know, how, how true is that about the eyes? Uh, that seems to me like that's a bit of a long shot to get from the eyes into the lungs, or for that matter, from the ears into the lungs. And the really risky part is the nose and the mouth. Am I right about that? No, uh, the eyes are important as well. Uh, if you, I don't know whether you ever used eye drops or not, but if you uh, put eye drops in your eye and blink your eyes a few times, you'll taste it in your, you'll, it gets into your nose and you'll actually taste it. It goes goes right down. The reason the eyes, the nose, and the mouth are because you've got mucous membranes there, the cells that are uh, highly susceptible to infection by a number of uh, viruses. And so uh, all three areas are um, uh, susceptible to infection. And uh, uh, it's hard to, yeah, you, you need to protect them all. Mm. Best, so best now, policy. now the virus gets into your system. The virus is in your nose uh, and it's going into your lungs. <clears throat> Does this happen in seconds or minutes or hours? Oh no! Uh, the, is there anything the virus, you can do? The virus, the virus uh, infects cells and replicates. It, it replicates, and so it's not um, instantaneously that it gets into your lungs. No, it has to replicate, and as the virus creates and builds up populations, it'll then migrate to other parts of the body, including including the lungs. So, uh, unfortunately, we don't have any antiviral or any prophylactic that will prevent that from happening. So, when you treat a surface that has this virus, these particles of virus on it, you use a percentage of alcohol and all that. <clears throat> but in fact, um, you know, some mouthwashes have alcohol in them, um, and I'm wondering if uh, if it, it helps at all once you think you've been exposed to the gargle with alcohol because the vir the virus particles are in that part of your of your throat. Um, and presumably that would break the lipid oil on the, on the surface of the particles and uh, make them inert. Uh, does alcohol in the, in the form of uh, something you ingest, does that help? I don't, I don't know, Jay. I can't answer that question. I would guess that most, uh, most of the uh, mouthwash that you would use uh, has a very, really low, low concentration of alcohol in it and probably wouldn't be uh, uh, preventive but you know if it's alcohol it uh, might uh, do some good but i i would doubt it i wouldn't uh, i wouldn't count on that the best thing to do is is uh, decontaminate your uh, surfaces and your hand wash your hands good so you don't transfer mm -hmm. it uh, and uh, do practice social distancing so you don't breathe it in uh, uh, let me you just, know, you uh, can't be uh, can't be one hundred percent protected, but uh, you can decrease it. the probability. So, so, um, so right now, there's nothing that stops it. Uh, and if uh, you know, we look at the researchers, uh, try to figure out what they're after. 
Uh, and by the way, I, you know, I've come to believe uh, that there are researchers all over the world working on this. Um, some really good people in the U.S. and elsewhere in many labs, and they are collaborating big time uh, big on time. the Internet, and they're sharing information, including the genome came from China and the like, um, to try to figure out how to stop this thing. Um, and maybe we'll have you know, an early response on uh, some, some kind of drug that will make the virus inert. But I just wonder what the, if you have any idea what, what the direction of that research is. So you have the, uh, the, sp the spikes on it. The spikes connect to a healthy cell. Uh, the spikes, uh, you know, uh, allow it to uh, replicate. Um, if you can uh, diffuse the spikes somehow, uh, then you can stop it from replicating. I mean, what, what is the theory of slowing this virus down biochemically? Well, there's a lot of different directions of uh, research, and you're correct that uh, there are thousands of scientists all over the world uh, um, working on this, but they're uh, looking at uh, two or three different uh, areas of research. One is that you're talking about uh, is an antiviral that uh, could uh, act either as a prophylactic or as a treatment uh, after a person has been infected. And that antiviral could act in any number of ways, but uh, the ultimate goal is to prevent uh, uh, replication of the virus and uh, kill it before it's to the lungs, to the uh, deep lungs, and causes severe disease. Uh, the spikes that you're talking about, uh, those are, they have receptors that allow the virus to enter the cells. And uh, the other air line of research is to try and develop vaccines. Uh, and one of the things that's been, uh, that's in actually uh, preliminary clinical trials is actually a peptide that, uh, that uh, blocks that receptor from uh, uh, prevent and prevents the cell, f the virus from entering the cell. Um, so, there's a lot of different avenues of research that are uh, being conducted. Uh, probably uh, more working on vaccines than there are on uh, antivirals, but uh, antivirals are a tough, tough nut to crack, you know. They're, uh, they're looking at a lot of uh, old uh, drugs that have been developed for other viruses or tested for other viruses. They've been in uh, many people so that they're considered to be safe. Uh, uh, chloroquine is one of these uh, drugs that, um, that they've uh, pulled off the shelf. It's an old malaria drug that uh, a lot of physicians are claiming uh, has some uh, effect. But as, uh, as Fauci points out in his uh, uh, briefings, uh, there haven't been any clinical trials on this, so we really don't know how effective that drug is. It's more anecdotal uh, work uh, reports from physicians who are using it with individual patients or a small number of patients. And so there's no controls to actually show for a, the fact that it is efficacious. But there are a lot of uh, old uh, drugs out there that have been used, developed for other viruses, and they're testing those. Um, so hopefully some of those will um, show some promise and, and actually uh, turn out to be a good antiviral for it. Um, so there's a lot of research going on in, in that regard. But don't hold your breath. Um, we've been trying to develop an antiviral for uh, the uh, flavoviruses for 50 years, 30 years, and we still don't have one. It's, it's not an easy thing to do to develop. A, uh, and the problem, uh, part of our problem with both the drugs and the vaccines, Jay, is that uh, we can't, uh, uh, we don't have a good animal model for a lot of them. And so it's difficult to, uh, to measure the efficacy without going into humans. And uh, that's uh, unethical in, in today's uh, uh, world. Well, you know, I'm, not that I really know anything about this, but it um, strikes me just to integrate what, what I've seen on television and read in the papers <clears throat> is that we have the genome. Um, and once we have the genome, we, we can see how the RNA works, uh, the various components and how it's set up. Um, and once we, once we know that, I think we do know that, uh, then we can do gene splicing potentially. Uh, 
And gene splicing, of course, is very frontier and CRISPR is very frontier. But the idea would be to, to find a way to splice this RNA, to change the genome of the virus uh, and to make it inert uh, using, say, a bacteria, which has the power to do that. Is there, is there anything going on about that? What do you think about that as a, a possible line of investigation? Actually, it's a very, um, it's a relatively new, not really new, but a new line of investigation. People are looking at it for a lot of different pathogens and it shows a lot of promise. I mean, there are ways, uh, ways of doing this, but the problem you have with the virus like uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 is, uh, uh, you know, it's new. Uh, we have the genome, we know what it is, uh, but to actually uh, re-engineer it uh, uh, won't work because the wild virus is out there. It's all over the world now, truly all over the world. And so how, how will you, uh, you need to develop something to protect against that old virus, not develop a new virus. And mm -hmm. uh, so I, I don't know that uh, gene splicing is so good to do a for this particular virus. Well, you know, in talking about the epidemiological side of this, yes, it is all over the world. And I'm not clear on one thing. Maybe you can help me, Wayne. And is that how many, how many varieties of this are there? Because virus, you know, virus and mutation are almost synonymous. Not only did the virus get created by mutation, but the virus itself mutates. And if you compare the virus and say the U.S., as a hotspot and, and Italy or Spain as a hotspot or Japan now as a hotspot, you're gonna find it's different. That the virus it may be similar, but it's not the same. And so what's happening is the virus is mutating while we watch, while the, the pandemic goes on. Am I right about that? I think you're right about that. Uh, whether or not that would influence our ability to um, have a good antiviral or a vaccine against it. Uh, I don't know. No one knows at this, this point. But our experience with other viruses that have multiple um, uh, subtypes, if you will, of, uh, of the virus uh, suggests that uh, uh, if for flu example, uh, that virus mutates and the vaccine that you develop this year is not truly effective uh, next year. Uh, flu is, uh, is a rather special bug, though, because there's something like 144 different combinations of the hemagglutinin and, uh, on those viruses that can change its genetics. Uh, we don't know how, how coronaviruses uh, relate to that. Uh, we know that uh, they probably mutate. We know from our experience with other viruses, those mutations can actually have a tremendous uh, effect on uh, phenotype expression, phenotypic expression, make them more or less virulent, make them attenuated in some cases, uh, uh, give them higher transmissibility, greater epidemic potential, if you will. So we don't know, it's too early in, in our uh, knowledge of this virus. Give us a, a few years and we'll have a better idea of, of how frequently the mutations occur and what impact that those mutations have on the epidemiology and clinical expression of the viral. So there seem Surely to be to um, a couple of, a couple of uh, possibilities here. One is the antibodies from people who have recovered. Uh, and it reminds me of insulin, which was originally made with uh, fetal, fetal pig material. And you had to kill a lot of pigs to get the insulin, but then they found a way to make it uh, artificially. Um, and uh, all of a sudden we have insulin for everybody. So query, can we take antibodies, which, I mean, I, I'm not sure that it's actually effective, but can we take antibodies from people who have recovered and then make those antibodies uh, artificial uh, and then spread them around the world to have the same effect on large populations? That there's a very active area of research that's uh, doing that very thing. You know, you're talking about two different things here. Uh, uh, you've read about the uh, plasma treatment, uh, taking plasma from uh, uh, convalescent patients and using that, infusing that into patients. Now that's an old, old, old method. It's been used for years and years. And in fact, at CDC, we always used to keep uh, anti. Uh, uh, viral plasma against uh, 
viruses that we didn't have any vaccines for. And um, that was used for treatment when someone had a laboratory accident and, and accidentally infected themselves. Um, so that's actually, I think, uh, uh, being tried right now with uh, COVID-2 virus. Um, the other is, though, to actually manufacture uh, the antibodies that you can actually then use for therapeutic uh, purposes. Uh, they're called therapeutic antibodies. And um, these uh, humanized uh, monoclonal antibodies uh, uh, should be, uh, could be very effective if we develop the right ones. Yes, that, and that's a very active uh, area of uh, research. I think there's one for, fellow in New Jersey or somewhere that's already developed a monoclonal antibody for COV-2, and it's going into trials uh, as we speak. Mm. Oh, and that would be synthetic rather than just taking it out of the plasma of a recovered patient. Yeah, yes. One other yes. uh, avenue I wanted to ask you about is, um, so now the virus gets into your lungs and it creates an inflammation, huge, huge inflammation in your lungs, which is so fragile. Uh, both uh, the exchange, the oxygen exchange cells uh, and, the, and the breathing cells are affected. Um, and the inflammation, you know, creates all kinds of, uh, let's call it schmutz in your, in your lungs uh, and you drown um, and, and you can't breathe very well. Uh, so the question is, uh, what can we do about this inflammation? It's just the body's own immune system uh, is what's killing the patient. Um, so we have to moderate the body's own immune system. Are there drugs? Can there be drugs? Is there any research going on uh, to minimize the, the inflammation and thus uh, the immune reaction that is so, uh, so damaging to the patient? You know, Jay, uh, this is an area that uh, I don't know a lot about, but I do know that uh, cytokine storms that you're talking about that yeah. uh, can uh, influence uh, that type of uh, pneumonia. Uh, there's a lot of research going on and a lot of other diseases create cyto cyto uh, cytokine storms as well. Uh, you know, the hydroxychloroquine that is given, one of the reasons they uh, think it is effective, the ones that are using it, is it's an anti-inflammatory uh, drug and it reduces the inflammation in the lungs. And so uh, it's an area of research. I uh, have not read uh, much about any progress in, in the area other than, when, other than with uh, hydroxychloroquine. Um, Perhaps uh, they're in some of these experimental uh, therapies, they're combining uh, uh, HIV drugs with uh, chloroquine, and it seems to be effective, but uh, whether they're anti-inflammatory or not, but the key is to reduce the inflammation, you're correct. Mm. Um, uh, we only have a, a couple of minutes left, and I wanted to ask you about vaccines in general. You know, uh, it's like a knee-jerk answer. You ask, uh, how long is it going to take to get a vaccine? And that's a, it's an optimistic thing because we, we're not sure we can get a vaccine. But let's assume that we, we have the talent, we have the resources, we have the scientific background to get a vaccine. It seems to me that a good part of the year or 18 months, um, you know, track of that, of that effort is in the trials. And trials are a matter of uh, finding patients uh, or trial subjects who will tolerate it and making close notes about how it works with them, whether it's efficacious, uh, whether it's damp, it's injurious in some way. Um, but it sounds to me, actually, and I, I think Bill Gates would agree, he's been very you know, high profile on this, um, is that you, you have to use the best technology you can find and one of the technologies involved in trials is, is, is information technology, it's databases. So isn't it true, or my theory anyway, I'd bounce it off you, is that you can move faster on that 18 months. You can move faster on clinical trials if you can use um, you know, AI or other uh, high speed uh, information technology. Wouldn't that shrink the amount of time it takes to develop a, a vaccine? I don't want to say no, 
but uh, my gut feeling is no, it, it won't increase the time. The problem we have is uh, that if you uh, give an experimental vaccine, give a vaccine to an individual, uh, it will take um, 30 days uh, minimum for you to actually find out its immunoge immunogenicity. Does it actually produce a result in producing antibodies, antiviral antibodies? Uh, but that's just the first step. Then the next step is you've got to follow that patient for probably at least a year to find out if the antibodies wane and become undetectable or, or not protective any longer. And, uh, and, and, and this is all assuming that you've done the safety, phase one safety uh, trials to make sure that it's a safe uh, vaccine. But then you've got to follow that patient or those uh, recipients for ideally for several years to find out if there's any adverse long-term adverse effects and if it actually prevents disease uh, against the virus that you you produce it against so i'm not sure people say 18 months uh, yes fda can fast track it and short circuit it uh, a lot of the but uh, you're you're dealing with the unknowns there because uh, you, you don't know what the long-term effect of that vaccine is going to be. So the safe thing to do is to, uh, to 18 months is, I, I think uh, you, if we have a vaccine in 18 months, I'll buy you, uh, buy you a, and I see you, JJ, uh, or more. <laughs> Uh, you so know, a vaccine, a, a vaccine, in, in, uh, a vaccine, Dwayne. Would, go ahead, go ahead. No, I'm just, just in today's world with the IRBs and the human uh, human uh, uh, try. Don't have, you know, in the old days we could do human trials. You could actually put the experimental vaccine or the uh, candidate vaccine in humans and actually measure the effect. Can't do that anymore. We have to use animals, and uh, and so there are just so many things that delay this process if we're going to have a safe vaccine. And you know, and I know, you know this area as good as I do, Jay. Uh, you're asking me all these questions. You know the answers to them. But uh, you know as well as I, if we put a, a vaccine developed in 18 months into people and then six months down the road or a year from now, some of they develop adverse events, whether it's a vaccine related or not, there's going to be litigation out the gazoo. And uh, so you just have to, in today's world, we need to be a little more cautious. Yes. And well, I think just back, to... To your, back to your point about AI and models, one of the reasons we have uh, uh, the fear and the panic that we've had driving this epidemic or pandemic is the models the models uh, you know uh, they they project uh, numbers that are out of this world and it scares people and and they're all um, magnitude or several magnitudes higher than the actual figures really are so what we need to do is step back do some good old basic epidemiology clinical and epidemia uh, lab lab work and find out what this virus is doing and then then start projecting so you know just in, in the way of um, i guess i'll use the word speculating but speculating on the basis of you know all your knowledge of the subject how do you see this unfolding uh, how do you see it coming to an end i mean because sometimes uh, correct me but sometimes viruses epidemics just come to an end all by themselves they somehow end um, how do you see this unfolding, to, you know, to, into the future? Uh, not not only uh, in terms of the science, but in terms of the uh, you know social and economic effect. Well, uh, again, I will say I don't know, but I will speculate a little. I guess uh, I think number one, uh, the case fatality rate is going to be a lot lower than the models projected it uh, would be. Uh, that being the case, uh, I uh, talked to to Rob Kay here a month ago, I guess, and told him, uh, looking at the preliminary data, I would treat it like a severe flu and, and focus on mitigation and reducing transmission, i.e. social distancing, 
uh, uh, cough and hand hygiene, etc. All of the things that we know reduces exposure. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think uh, the impact that it's going to have, if we lock down this country economically, uh, with the, the implications of the, like New York, it's going to have a tremendous economic impact. And it's going to come back to what I projected 10 years ago in 2010 at this uh, policy meeting that it's going to threaten the economic secure, security, not only of the country, but of the world. And uh, so the public health act of the economic, economic cure to be worse than the uh, disease itself. So I think we need to be very cautious about how we uh, proceed. I think uh, all of the evidence uh, from China and from this country uh, definitely suggests that the uh, so um, the um, the things that we're doing. Uh, quarantine, self-quarantine, actually working and decreasing transmission. That decreases a lot on the healthcare system, and we can manage that while maintaining uh, uh, maybe not business as usual, but uh, but some business uh, going on without shutting down the economy. I uh, I really uh, think that we need to be cautious about uh, shutting down the whole the whole. Uh, economy to to stop this now one thing about the coronavirus is we don't know whether it will just disappear like SARS did or whether it will become endemic like influenza is and come back year after year after year we still don't know that uh, it's a highly transmissible it seems to do well in humans but keep in mind it's not a human parasite it's a uh, humans are unnatural hosts and unnatural hosts tend to get rid of these parasites uh, unless it's really well adapted. So uh, we're going to, it's going to take us a year or maybe longer before we know exactly what's going to happen to this. I, if we, if our containment or our uh, mitigation efforts are good, we probably won't build the herd immunity that we need to stop the epidemic. It'll peter out itself. And here again, this comes back to your comment about mutations. Um, you know, we know that these that viruses mutate, and uh, those mutations sometimes um, uh, reduce uh, the virulence of the virus, so that the viruses can go underground. And uh, we know that this virus can already be transmitted in asymptomatic uh, cases. So that's uh, one mechanism that allows the virus to develop endemicity. So, bottom line, we don't know yet. Price of liberty is eternal village uh, vigilance, isn't it? <laughs> yes. Well, no. You know, there are people. We've been saying for years, uh, people in my field, that we need to do a better job of surveillance. We need better laboratory-based surveillance. We need to set up pathogen discovery programs. This is what we did in Singapore and what we tried to do in Hawaii: pathogen discovery programs that will allow us to detect, identify, and contain these bugs before they get on airplanes and fly around the world. And that's desperately needed. If we'd have done that with this virus in February, uh, we'd have had a much uh, smaller problem on our hands today. Well, that, that takes me to one last question, which I think I really need to ask you. And that is, where does testing fit in all of this? Uh, have we done a good job? What can we do better? Is testing still relevant? Or is it beyond testing? Uh, how do you manage an epidemic, a pandemic, uh, using testing? You don't manage it uh, using testing. You manage it uh, using mitigation efforts. You use the testing to to help you decide where best to uh, apply those those mitigation methods. Uh, you need good tests. And this is why he was so out of the uh, test, the PCR test that has been to identify this. You know as well as I do, uh, many of these um, uh, tests will, will be false positive, false negatives are false positives. And uh, the type of sample you take it, who takes that sample, where it's taken from, uh, how it's processed after it's taken, and the technician doing the test all 
influence the results that you get. And uh, drive-through testing, I, you know, it, it, this is where public uh, opinion in is driving decision making. I, would, uh, I wouldn't bet the farm on the results of those drive-through tests. I've not seen any any efforts to validate uh, whether the tests are accurate or not. But testing plays a very big role uh, in your surveillance system, Jay. You know that. You've got to have um, reliable tests and you use those tests to know how much transmission is occurring and where it's occurring so that you can target your control efforts uh, appropriately. So testing is, plays a critical role, but going out and testing everybody in the country uh, doesn't help a whole lot. Well, it, I've, I've become aware that there's two kinds of tests uh, for coronavirus. One is the PCR uh, and the other is the antibody test. Um, and yes. they, they both give you a different view of what's happening in this patient. And I wonder if it's possible to put them both together and test both, you know, use both of those testing technologies in the same test and get a better handle on, on what we really have in a given patient? The answer is yes. Uh, the answer is yes. And we get to need to get to know the virus a lot better. But uh, for uh, a lot of viruses, we have combined tests like that. We actually monitor um, certain antigens that are associated with viremia with the virus. And, uh, and the other component of it measures the antibody and uh, primarily IgM antibody because it's an antibody that uh, comes up fairly fast and is uh, protective. And so you have a combined uh, antigen antibody test and you can use it. Uh, they're not, uh, you can actually use it in point of care. But uh, the problem is, is uh, I, I know that my group in, uh, in Singapore has uh, developed an antibody test um, early on, they've been using it now for a month. And uh, I understand CDC and some of the other companies have developed antibody tests too, but my guess is they're focusing on point of care tests and those are usually lateral flow tests which have a very poor sensitivity and uh, specificity. So I don't know how good they are. I get the key is to validate these tests before you uh, spend a billion dollars uh, on the basis of the results. Same as models, you you need to validate them before you uh, make major policy decisions. Based ever on think the, about coming? Ever think about coming back into the fray, Dwayne? You know, you can retire a fourth time when when it's over. <laughs> well, I'm I'm I. Uh, I get uh, probably two or three invitations a week to uh, get back in the fray, but uh, you know, I'm 81 years old, Jay. <laughs> you know, these days you gotta watch out. <laughs> <laughs> and my wife thinks I ought to settle down a little bit. <laughs> well, thank you, Dwayne. Dwayne Gubler, uh, a researcher par excellence, a global research infectious disease and closely connected with uh, Hawaii. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your, your discussion and, uh, you know, uh, and, this, and all the points that you've helped us with. Uh, aloha. Thank you. Well, thank you.